Thank you everyone for joining this special event of um, special edition of how to change careers to increase democracy. All right, okay, so I am based in Los Angeles and I help people change careers. I particularly work with people who um, are not sure what they want to do next. So that's really what I focus on. And um, repurpose your purpose started a few years ago and the tagline here is use what you already know to do something new and I want to say something about it because during this time I've been reflecting a lot and um, in years of working you know, also with clients thinking a lot about this and you know when my my friend actually came up with this tagline we really meant use what you already know meaning skills to do something new like a new career <clears throat> But I really feel like the more I deepened my work and the more I worked with career changers, that really started to acquire another meaning, a meaning of, you know, you already know inside of you what, what you want to do. You might not know the name, you might not know what shape it takes, but you know. And so that knowing is really what I love to um, focus on and to work on um, with everyone. So these events, I always have, it's a bit of a nostalgic slide at this point, but these events started in 2017 in person in Los Angeles. And uh, we carry the same spirit um, this year online. And I really wanna show you um, this to remind you that even though we are um, in a virtual space, then we can together co-create this space of feeling like we share uh, a moment in time right, and, and space with everyone in a conversation. All right, so if you are serious about change careers and you want to um, join me, I have a group program starting up. You can look at repurposeyourpurpose.com. I'm not gonna go into details here, but I just wanna let you know it starts in October. So the very beginning of October and it's by application only. So check it out on my website. And let's start. Let me say a little bit more about today's, um, today's event. So what, um, what I want to invite you um, to do today is that number one, to take this event as a gift. When I started these events in 2017, we're really in the spirit of giving a space for everybody who's wondering about what they want to do next to feel welcome and to feel they could come exactly as they are. This is the spirit of today. So nothing is asked of you except for one thing, and that is your listening and your presence. It is by our listening and how we hold the space together that we help the speakers, the three people here that so generously um, agreed to share the stories to really be able to connect with us and share from the heart. Changing careers is incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly common thing, actually, like so many people change careers, and yet it's incredibly unique. Everybody has their own way they do it or they've done it. So that's the other thing about how you listen to the speakers today. This is not a, you know, they know the way and you don't know. It's more a, they are sharing their experience because behind it, you get to connect with your own truth. And I hope you find inspiration so you can find your own path to your career change, if that's what you're here for. Okay, and so in order to um, help everybody here drop in the space, I would like to start, and I always start any of my events uh, with one minute of silence. And during this minute of silence, I really wanna ask you to fill your heart today and to feel a lot of compassion because not only we're going to tackle some, you know, very um, deep topic and urgent issues, but also so many of us right now are struggling, whether with loneliness or overwhelm or parenting and work or loss or sickness or uncertainty. I just would like to invite that compassion in our space today so that we can hold it for each other. Okay, so. This is your first time with me, might be a little bit strange, but um, stick with it. And it's just one minute of silence.
Thank you, Elisa, for hosting us today. And here's how we're gonna work today. I'm gonna ask my questions first to all three panelists, starting with asking them to introduce themselves. And then Alisa is going to keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions you wanna ask, put those questions in the chat. And then at the end, Alisa is gonna pick some of them. If you have never been to one of my events, also you might not know that at the end there will be a chance to um, share with each other in breakout rooms. We do not record that part. So do not leave, stay if you would like to connect with fellow career changers here. All right, so, all right. Let's put a face to a name and start getting to know you. So first, a really quick round of who are you, my three panelists? Who are you? What did you used to do today? And what do you do now? Lightning quick. Who wants to go first? Okay. Hi, I'm Pilar. Oh, <laughs> that's for my, that's for the panelists. But thank you, Pilar. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Stay for the breakout rooms and then you get to do that. So Okay, sure. I don't want to call on you, but Roberto, Simon, or Hassan, just jump in. Simon, do you want to go first? All right. Yeah, I can go first. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Simone Singleton. I'm a software engineer at a nonprofit called Code for America. Um, I work on criminal justice reform and uh, getting people food stamps. Um, and before this, I was a historian. So I studied uh, the history of US social justice movements. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. And I'm Roberto Lopez. I'm a community organizer at the um, Texas Civil Rights Project here in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. Um, before this, I was a high school math teacher. Hey everybody, my name's Hassan El Tayeb. I live here in Washington, DC. Uh, I've known Aurora for quite some time. We're friends back in the Bay Area, so happy to see your face again. Uh, so I used to be a full-time musician, songwriter. I've toured the country about eight times. Uh, I taught lots of music and songwriting, played festivals. And now I am one of the, uh, I'm a lobbyist in D.C. I actually work to try to bring peace to Yemen, prevent war with Iran, and try to, you know, end the occupation of parts of the West Bank and, and Gaza. And so working really hard on Middle East peace for the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Wow, so really incredible stories of career change from everyone and very different stories. So my first question for you is, um, so was there a moment that you knew you wanted to do what you do now? Or was it a slow falling into it? How, how did it happen? How did you know this was your path? I like, in, our order of, yeah. <laughs> I like our orders of introduction if, we, if we're cool with going in that route just to <laughs> sure we can start that way we can start that way for sure I can go first hello um so for me it was neither like a falling in or a like very clear uh, sort of plan um it was more circumstantial I to, to make a long story relatively short I uh, finished up with my history degree and then was looking to do some kind of like uh, customer facing, like outward people facing stuff um, and got a job offer from a company and then found out that they had offered me like several thousand dollars less than my male counterparts um, and went into like renegotiate that and couldn't effectively. Um, so I just wasn't comfortable with like taking that on from like my own self-worth or ethics perspective. Um, and sort of went home, was uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Kind of hard to get hired with a history degree. Um, and uh, was like had my resume on every website ever, was reached out to by this uh, company that was doing a coding boot camp, And I was like, oh, that like seems like a hard skill that I could use. Sure. Um, had never seen a line of code before. Um, and then six months later, started working at Code for America um, because it was like this perfect intersection of this new hard skill that I'd gotten in software engineering and this like deep historical context around uh, criminal justice reform and like mass incarceration that I like held closely to my heart and 
had a lot of um, personal and academic experience with. And so it was sort of like this intersection of worlds that I like picked up the pieces for along the way. Um, but it wasn't like a clear North Star that I was always chasing. That's like, that's amazing, Simone. I love, I love that. That's awesome. Um, so for, I think for me, um, same, similar, it wasn't much of a, like a, a one moment, I think that really made it for me, but um, where I'm from, there are communities very much like a playground for, for the Department of Homeland Security to kind of have a lot of different um, tools and tactics and things to kind of keep, um, I guess to like, you know, it's like secure the border, which has a lot of uh, terrible connotate has a, has a lot of um, terrible side effects for, for our community. And so I kind of lived with that growing up. Um, and that's always kind of been in, in the back of my mind. Um, social justice is something that I, that I wanted to, to work towards. Um, but then when I went to high school, I was working, I studied, um, my high school was like a, a science magnet school. So I was really steeped in engineering and um, I got into a really good engineering program. I did that, but I midway through my college career, I realized that I did not like what I was studying and didn't want to do electrical engineering. So um, I knew that I had a very, that I had a social justice bent and wanted to come home and help my community because it's, it's really impoverished and there's a lot of issues with health and, and um, law enforcement abuse and all that. So I decided to try and find ways to get in through social justice Avenue and, um, Teaching was one way for me to kind of come back home. My whole family is, is in education. And so um, that brought me back to a classroom. And then from there, I started learning more and more about my community from like a very different lens and started to hear about the different nonprofits that work to support it. And so eventually um, I was hoping to work for the state Senate, but that didn't work out. And so I just started volunteering at a local nonprofit and I stayed there long enough until they hired me. And uh, now I work for, I've been working for the Texas Civil Rights Project now for about two or three years. So I think for me, it was trying to find a way into social justice. And eventually that kind of took several different routes, but, but I'm kind of here and I'm trying to figure out now what I, what I do with this. Not exact. These are great stories. I'm going to do my best here and not, not be too long winded. <laughs> um, these I've had a lot of kind of ins and outs in my life. So when I was in college, I studied politics. So I, I was sort of on this track to, to work on fixing issues like this. But after four years, I really lost faith that anything could really change. I said, this is a messed up system. For four years, I learned about all the wars that we've fought. Uh, and also 9-11 had just happened. And I, you know, was getting racially bullied and profiled that, you know, I have a, my family's from Jordan. I have a Muslim name, as you probably, you probably could tell. And I, you know, so I just sort of took my life in a different direction. I went to be a full-time musician. I wanted to make songs and make people happy with them and, and just go out and do my thing. About maybe 10 years later, though, I, was working at this elementary school at Stege. It was Stege Elementary School, lowest performing school, lowest performing district. And I, I was horrified. It, it's, it's basically an apartheid school where there are no white kids, you know, Arab immigrants, Latinx folks, um, you know, black students. And, and I was their music teacher. And I was just horrified by one, the money that was being poured into local elections uh, by Chevron, and, you know, just that whole thing. I was horrified like that we fought the Iraq war. We've got $6 trillion to spend fighting wars in the Middle East, but we can't afford books and, you know, like appropriate teachers, good facilities for these kids. And then just the systemic racism I saw you know, the fact that these kids were walking into class every morning, I mean, these are elementary school kids, and there are, you know, like six white cops arresting um, people in, on the front lawn of the school that 
I was just horrified. So I, I just decided to dust off the poly side degree and, and get back into the ring. And, you know, I, it took me from working on city council races and then to work on the peace movement to see how we can divest from, you know, militarism into our program, like into social programs like our education system. And that, that's been about a four year journey. It was just, I didn't really know where it was gonna lead, but here I am working on Capitol Hill trying to make laws with Congress. So, well, first of all, thank you. It's everybody has such a different story, right? And um, I never know what people are gonna say actually on my panel, though I talk to everybody before and I always find like I learn so much and I get inspired so much by hearing this. But the other thing that happens very often for me talking to career changers is that I didn't even know this was a job like peace lobbying. What? Like, what do you do? Or like Roberto or Simone, like you too, when I talk to you, I realize like, I don't even know about these jobs. What do you do day to day? What is your job like? <laughs> Can you tell us? Yeah, um, I'll start off, but if anybody else wants to start off, in another question feel free to um I yeah like, so uh, I like her answers and it makes it it makes it kind of hard for the two of us to go after you but it gives us a good model <laughs> to follow so there's no comparison okay. here <laughs> okay. No yeah comparison. okay well i mean kind of will be okay um yeah so i uh i'm a software engineer um and day-to-day -day sort of changes there are like a few categories of things that i work on um one is like literally writing code so um for example a project that people may or may not have heard about i'm going to provide a little bit of historical context so apologies for this being long-winded but um in uh california marijuana was legalized in uh, 2017 under prop 64 and part of that legislation said that if you currently had a marijuana conviction on your record um that you could get it expunged which is like it cleared from your record um which is good like all the sort of like marijuana legalization uh, legislation should have requirements in it like that um and that legislation passed it was a big deal everyone was excited um but for some reason like people weren't getting their records expunged for example um in san francisco where code for america is located um there were eight thousand eligible convictions um, but only 28 people applied, 28 out of 8,000, right? Which like, man, that means that there's a delivery gap between what legislation is saying is possible and what's actually happening. Um, and the reason after like lots of research that we came to was like multi sort of level, but um, it boils down to the fact that the government put the onus on people who were at this point wrongfully convicted. Um, to do something about getting their convictions cleared versus like the government taking proactive accountability for its impact on communities. So people had to pay to hire a lawyer. Lawyers charge, even though it's a free petition, charge anywhere from like two to $5,000 to fill out this petition. Um, or if you couldn't afford a lawyer, like you had to figure out how to read the law yourself, analyze it, determine if you were eligible. Um, Lots of people don't even know what their convictions are. Uh, it, like for context, if you go to prison and you leave, you don't actually get your criminal record. You have to pay to get your own criminal record. Um, you have to get finger, and you have to go like get fingerprinted. So you have to go to a police precinct and get fingerprinted in a precinct in order to have your own like possession of your own criminal record. So there's like all these layers that are happening that would prevent a person from actually going to get their conviction cleared. Um, and so, our idea was like, well, what if we did it for people? Like, what if the government did it proactively? Um, and so we partnered with San Francisco, uh, the district attorney's office there, and uh, built out uh, technology that um, automated that process. So instead of a person having to go and clear the conviction, they didn't have to do a single thing. Um, we like had access to bulk data, processed it, and then like determined who was eligible and all this is open source. So you could like go look at this code if you want to um, determine who is eligible and then cleared those records. So in California, I think it started in San Francisco and now it's like been applied in nearly every county in the state. So I think we're up to like uh, over a hundred thousand convictions have been cleared, which is really cool. Um, and so that's like 
a sort of a reflection of the things I work on, which is to say it's like a little bit about technology, but it's largely about like what systems are we working in? How are we um, like how are we limiting people from having e having equitable access to the things that they should have the right to access, like getting their conviction cleared or like food stamps? Um, and how can we use technology to fill that gap? Um, so it's a little bit writing code, a little bit working on policy, um, a lot of it like applying empathy and trying to like put empathy into structures. Um, yeah. And there was one thing that um, you mentioned to me that your team also consults with legislators mm -hmm. about what is possible. Can you say a little bit about that? Because I didn't, I didn't know that and I found it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, we're trying to like apply this sort of automated record clearance. There's a lot of like political will behind it. Um, and we're trying to apply it in lots of different states. So something else we've done is let's say that a state, I, I kind of have to be vague about which states this is happening in, but like, let's say that there was a state who was looking to pass, it, they're usually called clean slate bills and clean slate means like clearing your record. So let's say that there's a state passing a clean slate bill and they want to automate it. Um, one of my favorite parts of my job is that I get to go into the room with legislators and say, okay, this is what you're like, these are the requirements you're saying for a person to be eligible to have their conviction cleared. And a lot of places it's like, they have to have paid all their fines and fees. They can't have any violent convictions. And that's a whole other story about how we uh, categorize those things, but can't have violent convictions and maybe they have to have a job. Um, well, as, as a person who's coming in as a technical person, I can use technical reasoning um, to like accomplish ethical ends, meaning like I can say, okay, I think personally that it is unethical to say a person has to pay their fines and fees to have their record cleared um, because that's criminalizing poor people. That's not always a super convincing argument for people who don't, who aren't motivated by that, but I can say, um, I don't think we should use fines and fees because I think it's unethical and it's actually not possible because the database that holds fines and fees data is separate than the database that holds criminal conviction data and there's no way to uh, cross check them. So I can use a technical argument uh, to effectively like communicate some sort of empathy that I'm looking for. Um, yeah, and so being in the room with legislators allows me to sort of like wedge my way in into conversations that maybe I wouldn't be uh, a part of um, in a way that's really cool and sort of shape uh, legislation in a relatively new problem space of uh, criminal record clearance um, in a way that I'm pretty proud of. That's amazing. So we have a, a criminal injustice reform program as part of the Texas Civil Rights Project. So I'm gonna like share that story with, with our director in, in that program. Um, cool. But so, yeah, like on my day today, it's a little similar to what Simone was saying um, in that there's definitely a legislative component to it. Um, maybe like in, in the coding time that Simone does, mine is, is like just writing tons of emails. Um, but the, I think the work that, so like just to kind of give you all too some context for what I do, um, the Texas Civil Rights Project is, we've been around for almost 30 years now. Um, we have three different departments, voting rights, criminal injustice reform, and um, racial and economic justice. The racial and economic justice department is what I'm in, and we've been um, more on the front lines of immigration and asylum. And so my work is trying to dismantle the border wall um, and as well ensure that asylum seekers get to fulfill, like get to, get to act on the rights that they have. Um, if they're fleeing violence from, from all over the world. And what Hassan said earlier really resonated with me because every day I see, you know, like right now, especially um, children here in the Rio Grande Valley who don't have good connection to internet and yet we have billions of dollars to put up steel, but like steel posts across 93 miles of our community. Um, so my work involves like it feels like we're often throwing pebbles like against this like massive machine of the federal government. Um, and, it, and it often feels like we can't really do much. So I, I think I just take um, my, my goal is to dignify and give my community members, the people I work with, 
um, the, like the due diligence that they deserve. So I try to help tell the stories of what they do. So, and, and set up protests and, and do things like that to make sure that we're getting our voice out there. So part of my work means that I'm working alongside partners here in South Texas, across the border, um, that I'm, we're, we're emailing and strategizing about like what's going on with the latest legislation to fund more, um, more miles of border wall, for instance, or if there's some sort of egregious act that has happened, like let's say um, contractors destroy a cemetery or something because they're not being careful about where they're, where they're putting the border wall. Um, we try to tell those stories and, and sort of rapid response, um, develop a rapid response against those. Right now, um, I've been working for a little over a year to kind of to help put back this coalition of different organizations here in South Texas um, so we can have consistent actions and, and try to ask our local officials to, to remain accountable for like for whatever they're uh, doing in regards to the, to the border wall. So just to be more specific um, on that, back in 2017, there was a city here, uh, a city is called FAR, it's a real, it's a, it's a tiny city. Um, they passed a resolution condemning any sort of border wall construction. And right now, they have a whole block that's full, like a whole city block that's just full of the steel posts that are going to be going up. And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to be setting up a funeral procession to kind of call to attention, like the, num the, the tens of, like not the tens of, but the, the thousands of people who've died in my community um, because of COVID, um, like the lack of PPE and the lack of medical resources that's available in the area. And also we hope to like get a huge um, like banner of the resolution and kind of like put that into a coffin and then drive that out to a cemetery that's at risk of being destroyed by the wall. So um, my, our, our, like my work is working with different organizers and activists here and planning that out and, and structuring it and then going crazy on social media and trying to blast it. So um, yeah, my every day is like a bit of organizing and protesting, a lot of emailing, and then teaching Congress, especially congressional staffers, what's going on when it comes to immigrants because they have no idea, um, and and trying to tell them what their the policies that they're enacting is just terrible for people and, and results in some pretty horrendous situations like children sleeping on the streets, children dying in detention centers. It, it really ranges um, here in South Texas. Yeah, those those are great. Um, I hope we can work together at some point, you two. I, this is this is awesome to hear your stories. As far as my day to day, I, I would kind of put it into three buckets. One, I'm FCNL's Middle East lobbyist, so I'm constantly talking to legislators and their staff, uh, writing policy, getting members to introduce stuff, do letters. Um, and then there's another bucket where I'm, I'm representing these views in the media. I'm kind of on the, you know, BBC World News, uh, Al Jazeera, and just different media outlets that we're trying to just, you know, speak the truth and talk about what we're doing to Yemen right now with U.S. military support. We're essentially starving uh, millions of people with the Saudi-led coalition. Um, so working to try to get the truth out there. And then lastly, I'm trying to build coalitions and build public support, probably similar to um, what the other two panelists are doing is trying to build consensus and trying to, you know, drive forward policy and let legislators know that there are large constituencies in their districts, in their states that really care about this stuff. Um, one thing that I'm really especially proud of is during the course of the Trump administration, there have been eight vetoes so far. Five of those vetoes have been on policies that I've been kind of really like lobbying on. Uh, the Yemen War Powers Resolution, the Iran War Powers Resolution, and three, wep three weapon sales to, uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And that's essentially my whole portfolio that we've been working on. And the only way we're able to do that is because we got Republicans to support it. And so that is my, that's my favorite thing to do is to divide the right, um, to try to get, you know, libertarian conservatives who really care about Article I war powers uh, to go against Trump. And we've been able to do that pretty successfully because of our organizing, our, our rallies, 
uh, because of the coalitions we've built and that we've reached out to veterans groups and other libertarian groups to help us out. And so I feel like I'm a kind of a facilitator of a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of that bipartisan, you know, because they're constantly trying to divide us up. Why don't we try to divide them up a little bit? Because there's a lot of common ground that I've found that we can, you know, move forward with, not just on war powers, but, you know, all sorts of things like surveillance um, and, you know, emergency powers, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, anyway. So, wow. So that's a lot to take in, right? Um, there's There are a couple of things I want to offer to the audience right now. One is that, remember, I started to, to say, like, look also the truth behind the words. So some of these causes and issues might be super close to your heart, but you might also have other causes and issues that you want to get um, involved with. And so really listen for all of this. It can be ap applicable to a lot of other things, right? So I really want to invite you um, and to keep your heart open. I know that I'm already feeling so much pain, um, but also hope hearing the stories. Um, the other thing uh, why I wanted to um, have this conversation is that so often we feel like we have to, uh, you know, make a choice uh, between making a living or having a job and, and being involved with what we care about or activism, right? And so I really wanted to bring a conversation where actually things are, um, you know, people can um, integrate those different parts of themselves or the conversation. Um, so we don't always think of career as something separate from the rest of us. So I really wanna thank you for being also open, you know, your day to days and your stories. Um, I wonder if you, there was a challenge, something very different, difficult for you to, that you had to overcome in order to make uh, this, this shift, uh, this, this change of career. Uh, if you want to share, it can be like an outside, um, you know, like uh, an, an outside obstacle, like I needed somebody to say yes to me, you know, or it can be maybe something more uh, internal, like I was really scared of speaking up, I don't know, right? But what was difficult for you that you were able to overcome? Do any of y'all want to go first this time? Do it. I'll, I'll go, because I put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, something difficult to overcome. You know, I, th I think early on, there was a little bit of, it's kind of funny that I was making more money as a musician than I was doing political organizing. <laughs> uh, I'm not motivated by money, but there was definitely a concern of, okay, well, how will I be able to make this work? I worked for like this nonprofit. It's kind of funny. They were paying me like $15,000 a year or something really, really low. And then I was just, you know, teaching music on the side. So there was a little bit of economic insecurity, but I kind of, I got noticed because of the work I was doing, I got noticed by a larger nonprofit and they kind of scooped me up. And then they, they, then I made like a normal salary or whatever. So, so yeah, I think that was definitely a scary thing. And some, I didn't really have a lot of skills. So I, I was trying to sell, I'm like, Hey, I'm a musician. I know how to bring people together and trying to get people, you know, in politics to understand that that was a valuable skill. Finally, I was able to get a chance with this uh, organization called Chicago area peace action. And then they really quickly realized like, oh man, you know, doing and being a full-time musician, there actually are a lot of skills that cross over and bringing people together is a valuable uh, skill for political organizing. So, but getting people to realize that, like I knew it, <laughs> but getting other people to realize that took a little bit of effort, but I I'm glad I put in the time to do it because I'm, I'm so happy uh, in this role now. And one thing that um, you shared with me too is that you, you started to take initiative before you knew like, okay, I'm gonna end up doing this for a living, right? There was really something about, you start getting involved, you start doing something. Yeah, Th that's a, another good point. Yeah, it wasn't really about the, I've never been motivated by money. Um, and I was really just upset with money and politics. I didn't want Chevron buying local elections. Right over the school I taught at was this gigantic Chevron billboard as they were trying to buy, they spent 2 million trying to buy the local mayor seat during that election. 
Bernie was running to be president in 2016, and he said, you know, campaign finance reform was the center of his platform. So I was going around, I was registering everybody to vote. I'd go, you know, homeless people, I'd be registering them. You know, I, I was registering hundreds of people to vote in my district and just did it because I cared. And then I'm like, man, this is kind of fun. Like I really enjoyed talking to all this, so many diverse, uh, you know, groups of people and, you know, you know, making my, you know, trying to make a change in my local community. And then, you know, one thing kind of led to the other. I just kept following that passion. Yeah, I think that um, that not waiting for permission, not waiting for approval, but actually going with what um, feels, you know, that deeper knowing that I was talking about at the beginning, but like, you know, you want to do something. Um, I think it's so powerful and I've seen it over and over, you know, even in my life. Okay, so who wants to go next? I can, I can go next now. Um, so for, yeah, for me, I mean, I spent a lot of time, like I know quite a bit about renewable energy power systems, for instance, but there's like very little of that application in immigration. Um, and I think one thing that I, that I uh, had to learn very quickly is just like the history of immigration policy and laws um, which is so complex um, in order to do my job better. So that is one thing is just that when I was studying engineering, that took up the bulk of my classes and I didn't get to take a lot of um, other things, like even like, like racial analysis or immigration, like just an analysis of how it affects indigenous communities, for instance, because there's a lot of indigenous people who come from Guatemala um, to, to the southern border and understanding those stories and that history and culture is, is all important. Um, and then when I was teaching, I was just so focused on that, my students, but again, that didn't fully apply. So for me, um, I, I thankfully, I had such an incredible team here that was so welcoming and, and has been, um, they've been amazing mentors. And I think for me, in order to grow into this role, I have like asked them for books and things that I could read. Um, and they have just given me like tons of, of information, like, the, the wealth of knowledge that they got from, a, from their undergraduate degrees, which were very much like his, Latin, Latinx history focused um, or had, or like just through their years of experience reading amazing articles and books and things from other people in the network. Um, so I think that listening in and, and attending workshops and convenings, um, things that also start to introduce you to other people who, who are experts in this space and, and learning to read their work um, is a way that I started to learn more about, about what I do. Um, yeah, I think that that was one challenge that I've, that I think at this point I've, I've gotten, I've overcome. For me, there were sort of three challenges in succession and I'm sure there will be many more. Um, but, uh, the first initial challenge was just learning how to code. Like I had never seen a line of code before in my life. Um, and then jumped into like a full-time nine to five software engineering program um, and was a full-time engineer six months later. Uh, and that's like a very specific skill set, right? It's not like lear learning about American history and then learning about Mexican history. It's like an entirely different, different way of thinking. Um, and so for me, like building that muscle memory, uh, sort of breaking down my like logic and applying it in a new way was really challenging. Um, and then after that, after I sort of like got a, a grasp on like what it meant to write code and to build applications, like then it became the challenge of trying to find a job and market myself as a person uh, with six months of engineering experience uh, from a non-traditional background. Um, and trying to figure out the way to tell my story and, a, and modeling it in a way that was compelling enough that someone would give me a chance to get into the room. One thing I've like always felt to be true about myself is that like once I get my foot in the door like into the room I can very successfully make a case for myself um but you know when someone's just looking at a piece of paper uh it doesn't necessarily like create the narrative um and highlight the skill sets in a way that is always compelling um and so I actually ended up starting at Code for America in an apprenticeship uh which was particularly targeted and if people are looking to um transition or interested in apprenticeships, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but an apprenticeship, which is specifically targeted at non-traditional engineers. So that's people who are career changers. That's um, 
people who are older or from underrepresented backgrounds. Uh, so like in my cohort, it was the first cohort of apprentices. There were two of us that did um, coding boot camps, and then a third person did a data science boot camp and was a career changer. And at the time, I think she was in her late 50s. Um, and so we and she had been an English teacher for like 40 years before that and then transitioned into data science, uh, which is really cool. So like we were all very non traditional um, and found a way to like market ourselves and find this specific apprenticeship. And honestly, like if you're apprenticeships are a great way to like get your foot into the door um, at a tech company because they're specifically targeted to people from non traditional backgrounds. Um, so that was the sort of second hurdle was like, okay, how do I get a job and then I got the job and was just like washed inundated with imposter syndrome like i came in i was working with people who had engineering degrees who had been engineers for 10 years who were using all these acronyms i didn't understand like it was literally like they were speaking another language and i was the first uh black engineer first latina engineer at the company so like uh very demographically different than the people that i was interacting with and um they were wonderful, really invested in me and like wanted to teach me a lot. Uh, but I didn't necessarily believe that. Um, like there were times, for example, uh, we do this thing called pair programming, which is literally like you're sitting side by side with a person and you're writing code together, like your screens show the same thing and you can both control the screen. And there would be times where someone would like uh, ask me to do a task that I didn't know how to do. And instead of just saying I didn't know how to do it, I would like say I need to go to the bathroom and like run to the bathroom and Google how to do it and then like run back and then like pretend like I knew how to do it. Uh, which is such like a ridiculous, like stressful place to be in. And also like they probably were concerned with the like amount of times that I went to the bathroom every day. <laughs> but um, it was this like self doubt or questioning that I had to sort of overcome and realize that like it wasn't actually serving me in any way. There's this um, this saying that I really like, which is um, don't put a question mark where God put a period, uh, which means like don't don't question a circumstance that you're, that you're in. Like don't doubt it once you've already, it's already been given to you. Um, and I think it was just like acknowledging the fact that I was there and I had earned my way there. And also that it wasn't like a mistake that I, my personal experiences and skill sets and perspectives and my history degree, like all those things actually made me a really excellent engineer and made me an engineer in a way that nobody else could be. And so sort of like crafting my narrative as like a person or as internally, the stories I told myself about how I was an engineer. I think it took me like a year to even say like, I'm an engineer. Um, so I think those are all like hurdles that I've worked my way through. And I'm sure like, as I come into the next thing, there'll be some other form of, uh, development that I'll have to push through them too. But yeah, that's me. Wow, okay, so um, I had other questions, but I feel like you're all answering um, these questions in your stories, which is fantastic. So I wanna skip ahead on my questions and, and ask you, what are some opportunities, trends, or professions that you see now that would allow someone to do work that makes a difference? Like I know a lot of people here are like, are really looking to change careers so that they can get involved, right? So do you see some openings uh, and something uh, that people could um, check out? Maybe I could just jump in here. I just shared a resource with folks in the chat and I would highly recommend folks that want to get involved in politics, that want to actually make a real difference in a lot of these things that we're talking about here, is to check out the Progressive Talent Pipeline. And my, I trust it, my friends are actually running it, uh, folks at Demand Progress, Center for Economic Policy and Research. And they're working with our friends at the Congressional Progressive Caucus to try to push people. I don't, maybe we have a you know, diverse coalition of viewpoints. You know, this is definitely a progressive uh, initiative, trying to get Hill staffers into these key roles. And if I've learned anything working on the Hill here and doing lobbying is that a staffer um, can change so much of a member's policy. It's really difficult to become an elected member of Congress. It takes a lot of money, a lot of resources, a lot of time. But what's our end goal? In the next three to five years, I think this is probably the biggest opportunity 
for the left right now is to try to fill these key staffer roles and yeah, be on the Hill. Somebody asked if, um, you know, you have to be in DC for the progressive talent pipeline. I don't think so. Um, you could be a district staffer, but the people that do a lot of the policy work are definitely in DC. So it might require relocation. And, um, but you can definitely be a, a staffer of a, you know, a member in your own state or your own uh, district. So I would encourage people to apply anyway, and they might be doing trainings online. I'm not totally sure where the status is. Somebody asked a qu one quick question. I, I didn't know if now would be a good time to respond. I believe it was to me, uh, Kiara. It, it asked Go about, for it. Go for it if you want to answer it. I don't have to, but <laughs> I felt like I just wanted to address it. And the question was, is this job, have you ever found yourself working with people you don't have the same ethics as? How do you handle the situation? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I work on Capitol Hill. I talk to Republicans all day long. Um, you know what I do is I, I try to divide and conquer. I try to divide and conquer the right and, you know, try to find an area that we can agree upon, let everything go. I mean, I've worked with Matt Gates's office. I'm, a, I'm actually a, an acquaintance with his legislative director. I, I went to Rand Paul's staffer on Middle East policy. It is really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of wild how, how much of this stuff dissolves when you actually talk to people face to face. So if we can come to a consensus on an issue, I say all for it. Let's keep, uh, let's keep going here. Anyway, I just wanted to address that one. Okay, uh, Simone and Roberto, how about we switch the, the, the order completely? Simone, do you wanna go next? <laughs> yeah, I could do that. <laughs> Uh, sorry, so the question is just like, are there, do we know of any opportunities? Yeah, for like, like if you? somebody right now, you know, is looking to get involved, like, um, mm -hmm. I'm very much outside, right? This, uh, this is not my expertise, but even from the outside, I think yeah. there's a lot of movement right now. And, and I think there's more energy yeah. around getting involved. And so what are some either resources or professions or trends or something for people that want to make a living actually working on issues? Yeah. Um, so I, I have a very direct answer to that, which is, so the work I do sits under the umbrella of civic technology, which is like the, the intersection of like government and technology. So I'm gonna post a link right now um, to a job board um, on Code for America's website. And it's not just like engineering roles, it's tons and tons of uh, roles at companies that sit at that intersection between uh, policy and technology, um, nonprofit and for-profit. So that's like a very direct, you can go look at this and see what kind of job postings are there. Um, but what I would say like to take a step back is that any job can be a job that influences democracy. Um, because like inherently to be a person in America is to live a political experience. Like politics affect our lives every single day. Um, and so even in the job, like even as you're thinking about like, oh, well, I wanna be closer to um, maybe political work, like a great place to start would be, how can I uh, inject that into my work right now? Like, what can I do right now um, in whatever job I'm working that maybe takes us like one step closer? Maybe it's, um, maybe your company has like a diversity, equity and inclusion group that you could hop into, or maybe it's like advocating for like, maybe you get, uh, next or October 12th off and maybe your company calls it Columbus Day and like maybe you could talk to them about like renaming it to Indigenous Peoples Day like things like that that are very small like steps that you can take in your current job um, is a great place to start because one it starts like working that muscle and um, two it reminds you that you're capable of it and that it's like politics and democracy and uh, creating an equitable world is not about the job title you have, but instead like the daily work that you do, the way that you treat other people, the things that you prioritize. Um, and so that's sort of like my philosophical thinking <laughs> on democracy. Um, but to answer your direct question outside of this job board, um, I mean, there's tons of like, tons of work at that intersection between technology and policy. Uh, another thing that I will Yes, absolutely a full contact for it. Um, another thing that I will say is uh, Code for America has this thing called brigades. So they are local volunteer groups in cities all across the country. There are 90 of them. 
um, that you can go to with whatever skill set you have and uh, get plugged in and start working on technical solutions to government issues. And uh, you don't have to have like experience. There are people who've never written a line of code and want to go learn. Um, and that's a very hands on way to do it. Or maybe you have 10 years of design experience, but have never done it in a government space. Also a great place to learn it. So uh, those are my like multi level answers to that question. Yeah, it also made me think of something else. Um, sometimes companies actually um, had a client that changed where they were working in their new workplace. You know, they love it because they, the workplace does pro bono work on issues they care about as a matter of routine. And so sometimes it's also that um, where it can be a very involved uh, workplace no matter what, what the topic is. Okay, Roberto, the mic is all yours. Yes, and I, I love both of those answers. I think like, I mean, back in, so back in 2018, um, there, we were dealing with the family separation crisis. So like immigrant families were, were having their children taken away from them and, and uh, that was very difficult to encounter. But one of the really nice things that happened was that attorneys from all across the country working at like really large law firms that deal with a lot of other things unrelated to immigration just started calling and asking how they could help. And so we um, had them like essentially fly down to, to South Texas and like represent these families and get them reunited with their children. And we were able to place like a few hundred families um, with during that summer with, with free pro bono support. So I definitely think trying to like shift, figure out how you can work within your, um, within your space is, is, is really powerful and does get you like definitely moving down down that track. I, I think in terms of like an opening um, of what may exist right now. So I, I like this is just like a hunch, but I kind of feel like with the passing of, of Justice Ginsburg and like I like it feels like things are a little, a little look, looking a little dark for progressive movements. And so for that reason, I think it is like more important than ever for people to maybe not more important than ever, but extremely important for people to like really be doing exactly like what Hassan was saying to like getting involved in local politics, getting people registered, making sure that um, like Voting Rights Act was was kind of gutted a few years ago and and voter suppression is going to be is, is going to be increasingly rampant, especially as the court becomes more conservative. So like that sort of thing, making sure that people are still voting and that we're still going out and protesting and doing as much as we can to fight back is so important. So as safely as you can during the virus, but hopefully, you know, after, I think making sure that we're kind of helping with getting out the vote and that sort of thing is, is going to be um, a way that you can also kind of get involved while still keeping um, your job and, and doing that. We need a lot of election. So our organization throughout the state of Texas, we do election protection. And I say throughout the state, but more so specifically like around uh, Austin, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, um, and uh, in my area. But we need poll monitors. We need people to like watch out so that way attorneys can kind of send like a threatening email to some election administrator and say, tell them like, hey, we're going to sue you if you don't open up your polls on time, like um, things like that. So, so I, yeah, I definitely think that for the next few years, protecting the vote and making sure that we're able to keep uh, the court may ch be changed for a long time, but definitely the presidency and Congress and those types of things need can, can still be influenced. Actually, I want to ask you, um, you all work on really, really, really important issues. And at the same time, some of these issues have been going on for a long time and, uh, you know, hopefully there's a resolution soon, but it might take also a long time to uh, make really big change. How do you stay motivated? What gives you hope? What keeps you sane? Um... I can start this one this time around. Um, it's a very difficult question to ask. I'm like kind of on vacation right now to do that, to kind of like take a step back um, with like, I've, if, I've seen some really terrible things now like here in South Texas. And so it's been, some of those things stay with me. Um, I definitely do some counseling to help with that. I am taking some time off right now to help with that. But um, in terms of like, uh, of still moving forward, I have a couple of personal sayings that I hold on to, like just this too shall pass is basically 
the one that I kind of hold on to, like, you know, not let, not letting your highs get too high or your lows get too low. Um, but I think something that, that really keeps me going too is, is like trying to do radical joy, like making sure that like being happy, staying alive, staying engaged, like those things um, is a way to fight back against the, the powers that be. And I, I really, I draw a lot of my energy too from like when I see migrants who've come from like, they spent their time like months traveling and, and they're like fighting the global forces of like these large corporations that are trying to keep them, keep them down and keep up like energy, uh, keep up these borders and that are, you know, killing lots of people. And so I, I don't know, like just living is an act of resistance uh, against everything, just staying engaged, being happy, going on, you know, finding the little happy moments, whatever you can is a way to, to, to stay energized. It's for me, I, I try to think about that. I think about all the people who are suffering and yet still press on. And that gives me a source of, of power. Should I go next? I can go next. Um, for me, I mean, it is challenging work. Um, especially when, from my perspective, and I think this is true around a lot of policy, um, sometimes people can forget that policy is about human beings. Like it's about real people um, and every number on, on this spreadsheet or whatever they're talking about is like a real human being. Um, and so that can be really, really emotionally draining and uh, can show you sometimes like the worst about human nature. Um, for me, um, yeah, like I have, I have sayings that I will like kind of ground myself in. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, uh, I do what I can while I can with what I've got. And it just like, you know, you show up, you try your best and like, no, no one person can make or break any, anything. We're all just like individuals and there's a lot of a power in our collective action. Um, but there's only so much that I can do. And I'm actually doing a disservice to the people around me. Um, and to the like deep, deep history of um, resistance and activism uh, by approaching the situation as if I'm the only one solving the problem. And so I think staying rooted in the fact that like um, I have limits um, and should protect my like energy, uh, that that's a priority. Um, and uh, being sort of grounded or energized by the fact that my ancestors have been doing work like this for centuries, you know? Uh, people have been doing work to change the systems, uh, to build community, to create safety for centuries, from a, like for a very long time. Um, oh, <laughs> and uh, it's important to remember that that's the truth. Um, and there's actually like deep power in being able to tap into that historical context and say like, look how far they came, right? Like, let's not forget that the civil rights was what, 60 years ago? Like that, the civil rights movement, 60 years, one generation, my grandma was alive. And uh, like, look where we are now. And hopefully in 60 years, like my grandkids will look back and be like, man, like look what my grandma did. Um, and so just remembering that we're part of this very large story and that we're right in the middle of it um, is, is, is um, grounding for me. You know, it's kind of weird. I'm gonna gonna say uh, maybe something that contradicts what Simone just said, but I completely agree with everything she she just said too. Uh, I I really believe that individuals can make history, um, and I think folks on this call and folks in this this chat, I, I think if we work together, we can make history. And so, I guess I just still have a lot of hope that we can make a huge impact. And I've seen how just a handful of individuals were able to make the Yemen war powers resolution pass. Um, I don't wanna to get too in the weeds, but that process of being able to actually pass something in this white, you know, with this Congress, with Republican controlled Senate, um, just has inspired me. And I think will continue to inspire me for years to come. And it, and it's not just because we passed something and it got vetoed, but it also was able to pressure Saudi Arabia to not wage a major offensive 
uh, in this large port in Yemen, which potentially saved millions of people, um, which it would have cut off the flow of all this uh, food and humanitarian goods. And that was just, you know, a handful of my friends on the hill, you know, just kind of trying to trigger a vote on war powers and building this bipartisan coalition. And so stuff like that really keeps me fueled um, to know that we can, you know, as individuals can make such a deep impact. Um, but I also agree with what Simone said is uh, we also have to be conscious of our own bandwidth and we don't want to completely burn ourselves out. And it's easy to kind of feel like that in this work, but I still, I still believe that, you know, we have tremendous power as individuals. I also have a little secret weapon. Um, I'm a musician. And I, I even I was a full time musician, but I still can play guitar. And man, does that help me recharge after a day of talking to these people. So um, anyway, that's all. Yeah, I really want to thank you all for sharing all this and uh, really for your generosity in sharing yourself today. Um, I have two quick last questions that I'm going to ask you at the very end, because before I want to um, Ask Alisa, first of all, Alisa, thank you for uh, keeping us going out right here and doing all the technical stuff in the background. And uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions about recording. Yes, we're recording this and they will be, it will be posted uh, by General Assembly and also on my blog. So um, you will definitely get an email about that. Um, Alisa, do we have some questions uh, from the audience from the chat? which I've not been monitoring because otherwise I cannot follow the panel. <laughs> but I don't know, okay. Uh, I'm not hearing anything. I think we pretty much answered okay. some of them as we went along. Um, yeah, I think, I, I feel like we pretty much were answering them as we went along. Um, there was one question and I believe it was, um, what are the challenges that you've had in adjusting to your new careers, uh, things to grow into, and have you had support as you do that? And that was from Ivana. Okay, so I think uh, some of you already shared, I mean, the challenges, but maybe this idea of support um, can be very, very powerful, um, especially when you change careers. So if you have a new challenge or if you just want to share about the support. I can answer that a little bit. So I, I already sort of listed out some challenges. Um, and I think the challenge and the support of Connected, which is uh, one of the really hard things to do when you're new in a space is to say that you don't know how to do something. Um, to like acknowledge the fact that you're, you don't know what you're doing, you know? Um, I have this secret, uh, this, this secret suspicion that like most people don't know what they're doing. Meaning like, and I don't mean that as like a diss, I mean that like every day we show up and we try our best, but like every decision we're just like using the information that we have and trying to do like make the right choice. And sometimes we don't know what the right choice is. Um, so for me, it, the, the support actually came as soon as I asked for it. As soon as I said like, hey, I'm really struggling with learning this thing, like can you help me? Um, I got the support I needed. And in fact, like it actually gave the people around me a lot more insight into what I was struggling with and a lot more respect for who I was as a person for me to be able to acknowledge my shortcomings and to express that I had a desire to grow. Um, I think like something really exciting about being a person who wants to change careers, what that means about you is that you are willing to grow. And that is not a thing that all human beings tap into. So the fact that you're questioning those things and reflecting on those things is inherently a strength. Um, and so I, I think just being able to articulate that and not see that as a sign of weakness, but actually as a strength, as um, something that you should do repeatedly, um, helped me get the support that I needed and actually helps me now support other people in the same way. Something that I wanted to add earlier is I think if you're, you know, in changing a career, I, what I have found to be extremely helpful is, is, yeah, like having other people to kind of help me figure out things and like learn from them. So I definitely recommend looking up it, whatever career field that you want to go into, like fellowships or programs 
or, or like what Simone was saying, like having like an apprenticeship or something, because you, you get to have other people to like struggle and learn alongside and having that sort of accountability and, and fellowship is just, is probably is, is extremely helpful. So when I was teaching, for instance, um, I mean, I switched from engineering to education. That was one change. And I did that through Teach for America. So I had a group of people that I was working alongside and, you know, it's really nice to, to drink alongside like other teachers and, and, uh, like just talk about how terrible your first week was with, with them. And, and that helps, you know, get you along. Um, similarly now, like as I went into the tech, into TCRP, whenever we've had a really bad immigration week and there have been some really, really bad ones. Um, it's been really nice just to kind of chill with the team and, and talk about these things and, and cope with it and figure out what our next steps are. So, I would say that in anything you do, um, we're, we never really do anything alone. And so making sure that, that you have that support network when you're about to jump into something, I think is extremely um, important. I, I don't have too much to add there, but I would just say that every election cycle is a chance to jump on a campaign. And that can be a great starter place to you know plug in um, become an organizer, you know, whether it be like knocking on doors, making phone calls, raising funds. Um, and then that can, you know, if your candidate wins, that can lead to an actual office job. Uh, and definitely check out the Progress Talent Pipeline. I, I, I think, you know, like I was saying earlier, you know, getting good Hill staffers that, um, that really want to make a change and that are motivated can be really, really powerful, especially if you're, you know, willing to kind of be a little bit, you know, to challenge the status quo. I think we need more people like that. So one thing that um, hearing uh, all you were saying made me think about is also that, um, you know, if we, if we personally remember a time when somebody asked us to help and, you know, generally, like they generally needed some help, sometimes giving that help is one of the most rewarding things in life. And so I find that um, sometimes asking for help and for support can give another person uh, an opportunity to actually feel they have something to contribute and do not underestimate that because it's very easy for us to feel like, oh, you know, I don't know this or whatever, but there's really something about feeling you can contribute to another human being. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, all right, so Sorry, do you have more questions? Have, like two more people uh, who are interested in hearing a little bit more about working with uh, people with different ethical standards. So just kind of wanting to expand on that a little more. Yeah, I can hop in on that one. Um, I mean, it's challenging, right? And particularly in this, like, um, as time has moved on, there's been like an increase in polarization in political opinions. Um, and there's like a lot of things that uh, sort of feed into that, which I won't tap into right now. But um, like at the end of the day, if you're working with someone on something, it means that you have collective interest in it inherently. Um, I'll speak from my personal experience. So I work on record clearance. And a lot of times I'm working directly with district attorneys who are the people who give people convictions, right? Like that's their job. Um, and there are reform district attorneys who have like different opinions about um, like the way sort of the criminal justice system should work. But regardless, like there are differences fundamentally. Um, and so part of my job is going into really conservative places like Louisiana and being like, okay, cool. Like we're here because we are working on a clean slate bill. So there is um, a lot of bipartisan support for clean slate bills. And that's actually rooted in very different reasons on different sides. Um, for the most part on the right, it's rooted in uh, economic motivations. Um, so it's super expensive to like uh, police people. Um, it's super expensive and it's not very effective. And um, it's also, lim okay, so if you have a conviction, there are lots of, there are over 60,000 uh, ways to legally discriminate against people with criminal convictions, over 60,000. Um, and that's things like uh, saying you can't have a job or you don't have access to housing or you can't go on a field trip with your child. These are all legal ways to discriminate against a person with a conviction. Um, 
and particularly in smaller areas where there's a, a less of a workforce but higher policing um a lot of like communities just don't have enough people to work because they have convictions and so they can't get the jobs and so there's like a, a an economic motivation around okay well we need to clear these convictions so that we have more people to work and then there's a sort of like on the other side of it which is where i sit is like the ethical motivation around well like why are we punishing people for the rest of their lives like why are we why are we doing that especially after they've already served their time um and so a lot of the times it's trying to figure out where you do agree which is like okay we do agree on the fact that there should be clean slate law now how do i p tap into what you care about and present this information in a way uh that you can understand in in a context that you understand and some of that is like suppressing my own ego um and frustration um and I'm still working through that. Like it's a challenge for me all the time. Um, and like we live in a nation of people with different opinions and some of those opinions are really awful. And uh, we kind of have to grapple with that fact. And for me, uh, a way that I can, can, can do that is to dig deeper into why someone would hold the opinions that they do, even if I don't agree with them. A lot of times it's actually rooted in fear um, or trauma. Um, uh, or like capitalist propaganda and like framing my own thinking with that level of empathy allows me to like be more effective at my job and actually make uh, the change that I want to, or at least work towards it. I, I love that response. Um, I just wanted to add, uh, if, do we have time? Can I tell a, a, a brief story? Is that okay, Roar? Um, yeah. So, on top of Middle East policy work, I I really care about my artist friends who are really struggling through this pandemic. So I I wrote a letter um, and calling for restoring uh, unemployment insurance insurance benefits, and I got 600 musicians to sign it, um, and from you know from famous people, the not so famous people, and then on my spare time have been lobbying uh, the House and Senate to try to restore these benefits. We, we met with Pelosi's office. Actually, I wanted to tell this story. I just met with uh, Senator McConnell's uh, chief, uh, deputy chief of staff. And we brought six Kentucky uh, musicians on that call to kind of direct tell their stories of what it's like to live in Kentucky right now without these benefits and that was really empowering and the staffers they they all knew the same artists and I thought that was just really they were like oh my god you know you know I personally didn't know the artists that they were talking about but but um but getting those stories there and it and it just got me, you know, at a certain point, you don't, you just keep telling these stories and keep getting more and more people speaking out and finding that common ground and like just continuing to find a way in the door, I think in the long haul is going to serve us. And it's also the, and regardless of the fact that we had different ethical beliefs as, you know, like they were clearly, okay, 600 is too much. We were like the 600 is really necessary. You know, we weren't in alignment, but the fact that we got, we held them accountable and, and had a bunch of musicians telling McConnell's like top people that this is really uh, impacting them, I thought was incredibly powerful. And I think that's just the, the power of storytelling is just, you know, get, going back to your personal experience um, is how policies change in the long, in the long term. Yeah, I have to echo both of uh all that I so one of the best I think the best skill that I learned in teaching um, it gave me a lot of patience like people aren't going to work with you your students aren't going to learn from you or work with you unless they unless they trust you unless they know you and, and unless you know them and know where they're coming from and what they're dealing with and that I didn't have that like the first half of my first year teaching that's I think what made it most the most miserable time uh, but after I got to know them better and sort of slowed down and put that in front of the math, then, then things went smoothly. And I've been able to carry that over into my work now. I mean, working in building a coalition uh, is like, it's difficult. It's like, it can be like herding cats and, and, it's, and it's 
there are people with lots of different backgrounds. The, the Rio Grande Valley in Texas is really complex. Like there are people who love the Border Patrol and were recent immigrants, for instance, or something like that. Or like uh, it, it can be, it can be uh, very tricky. But I think just exactly what what both both of uh, Simone and Hassan have said is just like everyone has their story to tell, um, and you have to learn where people come from in order to work for them, and in order for them to to work in order to, to, to work with them and for them to work with you. So I, I really think that if you're working with other people, you need to kind of slow things down and get to know them. Wow, yeah. So I have uh, two quick last questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, if anybody's watching this either now or maybe this is the recording and they're watching it and they're feeling discouraged or scared about going for what they want career wise, right? Like embracing their values, making a difference. Uh, what would you say to them? What would you like somebody to say to you when you were taking the leap? Run at what you're afraid of. I think I, we, we need you. We desperately need you. Our democracy can't wait any longer. Um, and it's, and, and there's also a lot of opportunities here. I, I think you'd be, you'd be surprised at, you know, I, I'm constantly seeing jobs available and people are like, Hey, do you know somebody that can be a campaign organizer in this, in this area? And so there's a lot of opportunities. Our democracy needs you and you all are awesome. Okay, jump in there. <laughs> I can go next. Um, I think what I, I would say a few things. Um, one is you only need one yes. You only need one door to open. You only need one opportunity. Um, and it's likely that you'll get a lot of no's. Um, and that's not a reflection of your ability to accomplish the task that you want to accomplish. Um, and I think I find that really grounding. Um, a sort of like higher level, maybe like life lesson I would share is um, for me, I try to root my decision making in um, making decisions motivated by love and not by fear. Um, meaning if I'm looking at a decision in front of me, let's say I want to change careers um, and do something that's more politically involved. The fear may be, um, I'm not good enough. I don't know what I'm doing, um, I'm not smart enough, I don't know enough people, I don't have the right degree, right? And the love is, man, I really love my community. Man, like I, I really love the imagining of the, the way the world could be. Um, I love being empathetic. I love uh, creating a society where people feel safe. Um, and so for me, a lot of like the ways in which I can quell my own insecurity and anxiety is to say like, is this thing I'm feeling motivated by fear or by love? And I just try every day to just keep making the choices that are rooted in love. Um, and when that happens, I think we end up in the right places. Um, so I, that, those are sort of like my words of wisdom. And the final thing is just like, shoot your shot, just go for it. Like if, you, if you're having this inclination uh, you should listen to it. It means that there's something more and there's something you're trying to tap into. And uh, I hope that you can trust yourself enough to do that. Um, I think for me, I, I would say just take it in, in a way, like we want to, we definitely need to have this pressure. We need to feel like, like things are, are urgent and we need to get to them. Um, but you kind of have to do like a little bit of of double think or something like some sort of good double think to keep yourself sane, which is like also saying like, you know what, it's okay. Also, like if I, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, I like, I like this, this comic. It's like, at the end of the day, we're all just a bunch of talking monkeys on a, like a floating rock hurtling through space or something. Like it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of, you have to kind of think too that, <laughs> Not everything is as is as dire as it may seem. Um, so, at the same time, yes. So it, it's like it's both of those things. But um, that's what I try to do sometimes if I'm getting too 
caught in the weeds or, or just I'm going to I'm going to burn out. I have to switch that off and, and tell myself you're a talking monkey and that's OK. <laughs> you know, that's helped me um, a lot too to have a little bit more of that perspective that sometimes, you know, we might feel it's all on us and we feel this enormous pressure and to sort of take some perspective and that uh, there's a whole universe um, out there. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, that's really helped me a lot um, in my life. Um, okay, so if anybody watching this wants to learn more about what, what you do or get in touch, um, how should they find out? You want to put it in the chat? Well, say it out loud, actually, just for the recording. And then if there's a link you want to put um, in the chat, that's good, too. Yeah. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn um, under my name, Simone Singleton. I'm the only one. Um, <laughs> or you can uh, feel free to reach out to me on email, although it may not come through to me. So just LinkedIn's probably better. My email is Simone, S-Y-M-O-N-N-E, at codeforamerica.org. Um, yeah, please feel free to reach out about boot camps or change of careers or apprenticeships or democracy or whatever your heart desires. Yeah, and check out Code for America. It's a great organization. I really need to get a LinkedIn, so I do <laughs> not have one yet. I need to. It's on my to-do list. Um, but you can find me uh, at my, I have a few different accounts. So I have Twitter and Instagram at Roberto uh, Ale Lopez, A-L-E Lopez. Um, and my email is robert at Texas Civil Rights Project, all, all spelled out, dot org. Um, and then you all should really check out TCRP, the Texas Civil Rights Project. We have, uh, we have a lot, we, we need a lot of help. Um, so I hope you find one of our programs and are able to, to volunteer and, and work with us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, keep in touch. Um, my email is Hassan, H-A-S-S-A-N at fcnl.org. I've dropped my LinkedIn in the chat here and um, I am so inspired by the other panelists here and everything that Aurora has been working on. She is a powerhouse and <laughs> I, it's been great to see, you know, your amazing transformation and your career change here too. So I appreciate you all. Thank you, Hassan. You know, if you, if you know me and you change careers, you're going to be asked to be on a panel. <laughs> Especially when you have such a great story, right? Um, all right, so um, I am going to officially uh, close this event. Thank you, General Assembly. Thank you, Elisa, for hosting us. I mean, really amazing um, to have this platform. And uh, thank you, everybody, to, you know, for showing up here and for being engaged and, and sharing your comments and your questions in the chat and for holding the space. And of course, thank you, Roberto, Simone, and Hassan for really sharing from the heart. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and so we're gonna stop the recording now, but if you wanna stay, I invite you to stay for an extra 30 minutes to um, talk to each other in breakout rooms. That part will not be recorded. Um, and it's just a, a chance for you um, to a little bit process, you know, what this meant to you, um, this conversation, and to have a little bit of um, you time connecting with others. Okay, so Alisa, do you want to say anything before um, the recording ends? Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and for our panelists. Those were just some very inspiring stories. Like, I'm, I'm very inspired myself. Um, if everyone wants to connect after this event, we're not going to be sending out that networking document in our follow-up email. Um, that's for folks who are here today. So please take advantage of that and grab that link. Um, the survey, I sent that link out as well in the chat. We really appreciate it and it helps us to continue with events like these. Um, and you'll all be receiving a follow-up email with the recording as well. So thank you again for joining us.